Today we're going to be talking about ECG and the EKG basics. So in order to start with ECG, we need to learn how to interpret the graph. So we have the graph, the x-axis represents time, and the y-axis represents voltage. Now the time can be split into each little box represents denotes 0.04 seconds. In one big box there are five boxes on the x on uh, horizontally and five boxes um, vertically. So altogether this one whole box represents 0.2 seconds. And Voltage-wise, on the y-axis, we have one small box representing 0.1 millivolts, so therefore the whole five boxes represents 0.5. The reason why we use this is in order to calculate, we need it in order to calculate intervals and segment timing as well as the voltage and how great is the deflection and so on and so on. One more, one more important thing is to recognize is the isoelectric line. The isoelectric line is a point of base where everything is at zero um, millivolts and zero seconds. So on the graph you can see if I was to calculate the box here we know each box is 0 0.04 or 0 0.04 seconds making this whole one box equivalent to 0 0.2. So if we were to calculate the RR interval so the, um, the time between this R peak and this R peak we have one, uh, three big boxes so that makes 3 times 0 0.2, 0 0.6, additionally 3 small boxes making 0 0.04 times 3, 0 0.12, so 0 0.6 plus 0 0.12 makes 0 0.72, which is a normal RR interval. Now the speed of the ECG paper really matters because usually the clinicians use a 25mm or 50. If using 50, all these calculations are completely extended and different, so try watch another video if in case you are using 50 but most 80% of the time in the clinic you use 25. Now the leads and the angles that the heart looked at are very important. You might have seen you always come across as a medical student or a doctor or a nurse or whatever you are, cardiologist, you might come across the leads from lead 1 to 3 and various RLF and V1 to V6. You might be wondering what these leads are. Leads 1 to 3 are known as the dipolar leads, they're the limb leads. So they go from, the leads one goes from right arm to the left arm, so it goes from a negative to positive, and lead two goes from a right arm to left leg, which is negative to positive again, and lead three goes from left arm to left leg, which is from negative to positive again. So these then go on to form the Ithoven's triangle. Now the trick here is, I will now illustrate how, where these angles come in and how they view the heart. So lead 1 looks at the heart in that direction whereas lead 2 looks at it more in a infra, uh, inferior direction and lead 3 is in the inferior. AVR on the other hand which is meant, stands for augmented voltage right and then AVO augmented voltage left and AVF okay, augmented voltage foot. These three augmented leads they basically give a bit more of a they just add three more dimensional view so they add a 3d view of the heart so now you can see the arrows which direction they look at the heart from if we were to add the precordial leads now we can then come go on to view the heart so these are leads 1 v1 v2 v3 v4 v5 v6 and they go on to add on basically more of a 3d image or basically around the heart of the atrium and the ventricle now simply put the 12 kg EKG allows us to view the heart in a complete 3D dimension to uh, uh, 3D dimensional view. So, lead 1 would always, so as you can see, leads, one, leads 2, 3, and AVF. So, if you look at my diagram, leads 2, 3, and AVF correlates to inferior surface of the heart so that makes sense if you have any sort of myocardial infarction or anything like this an ST segment, ST segment elevation would take place in leads 2, 3 and AVF so you need to come somehow instead of by hearting this concept you need to learn how these Ithomus triangle works and understand that we want to be 4 on the other hand you know they're the pre leads dotted as the red ones they measure or they measure the anterior surface, the electrical attitude of the anterior surface. Lead lead one, limb lead one, A V L and V five and V six, as you can see, all measure the lateral surface of the heart shown by the arrow. 
v1 again so that's the precordial lead one and avr measures the right atrium and cavity of the left ventricle activity i would suggest then sometimes you as a, uh, a student would have questions of how how does where does the deflections come in some are positive some are negative yet they are normal that will be further explained in the next video so just for now just understand where these leads and what angles they're looking from so now let's get into the basics so you have a basic ecg this is the re normal representation so the p wave represents atrial depolarization pr interval then we have qrs complex the pr uh, the uh, atrial repolarization is usually masked into the qrs complex the qrs complex represents a ventricular depolarization t wave represents ventricular repolarization and u wave are Purkinje fiber repolarization which is not shown in the image now the main thing to remember is this so usually a normal heart rate consists of 60 to 100 beats per minute so anything above that or below that is a pathological condition a pr interval as you can see here is measured from this point onwards from the p point onwards to the r point and that usually is 0 0.2 to 0 0.2 Two seconds 0.12 to 0.2 seconds anything above that could also indicate pathology or anything below that could indicate pathology now the amplitude is also important but the P wave amplitude shouldn't be no long no more than three millimeters or three millivolts that's equivalent to three boxes uh, the QRS interval so as you can see on the screen the QRS interval is meant to be less than 0.12 and the Q wave, or the next most important thing is the RR interval, 0 .0 0.6 to 1 second. In the pre, in just if you rewind back the video, I calculated an RR interval in the first slide where I got an RR interval of 0 0.72, which indicates it's normal. So pause the video and understand this concept carefully. So once you are familiarized with the normal values, so you pretty much need to buy heart what's on the screen. These values you need to know them off by heart how do we calculate heart rate normal heart rate is between 70 to 100 beats per minute bradycardia is usually defined as less than 60 tachy usually is greater than 100 there are three or four methods in my eyes to calculate heart rate using an ECG paper when it's given to you so we can usually calculate it using the number of QRS complex times 6 which or you can do the rate which is 60 divided by RR interval so in this case if we were to take the RR interval we can take the RR interval to be there's how many big boxes we have one two three four five six you know each box is 0.2 seconds so six times 0.2 is 1.2 so 60 divided by 1.2 will give you a beats per minute of 50 suggesting this patient is bradycardic if you were to do the third method, rip number 300 divided by the number of large boxes between RR, so it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 300 divided by 6, again gives you 50. Or you can do it simply by having a trick explained in this video. So listen carefully. Usually the first line, this only works for a 25mm ECG paper, if the speed of the ECG paper is measured at 25mm. If the first, the first line is usually 300, the next one is 150, then 75 no 100 then 75 and then it usually goes down like that so already we can see that this patient is bradycardic on the other hand this one you can again calculate it by the number of boxes so we have two boxes so 300 divided by 2 150 so this patient must be sinus tachycardic next step so after calculating the heart rate, you should assess the rhythm, whether it's regular or irregular. Don't think about sinus rhythm yet, just whether it's regular or regular. You can have a regular sinus or a regular non-sinus. So regular rhythm usually represents a constant RR interval. As you can see in this image, there's always a constant number of boxes between the RR intervals. An irregular rhythm is when there's RR interval in constant, inconsistent and varies a lot. This usually represents pathological conditions such as atrial fibrillation, flutter, and AV blocks, which we'll not be discussing in this video because this is just simply the basics. So you should look for 
So here in this video, you can see that um, the the number of boxes here vary. So here is two boxes, but here there's three boxes. So you can see there is some sort of irregularity in the ECG. But this ECG, on the other hand, you can see again there's pretty much it's one, two, three, one, two, three. One two three, one two three, one two three. So this is pretty much normal as well. Now, does the ECG show a sinus rhythm? So main question is: Is there a QR? In order to what does sinus rhythm mean? Sinus rhythm means whether it, the the beat has been generated from the SA node, sinoatrial node. Hence, why sinus sinoatrial node. If the answer is yes, so the main question is: Is there a QRS complex present? If so, is there a P wave preceding it? If yes. Is sinus rhythm if no then it's not sinus rhythm so are they so what you should look for the leads that you should mainly look for are lead on lead to usually is there a P wave followed by a QRS segment if the answer is yes to all it is likely the electric impulse began in the SA node now you can see this every, for every QRS complex there is a P wave preceding it where my arrow points so you clearly know and with the interval being equal all the time so you can say this is sinus regular rhythm so if not sinus i.e. if it's not originating from the SA node where else could it originate from so directly from the AV node this is known as atrial rhythm uh, or it can be a junctional so between the um, septal junction so after the AV node the um, fibri um, the depolarization could occur so look for junctional type V, or it can be from the ventricles directly itself. So these are might be a bit too complex for you to understand right now, but the main thing I want you to focus is just sinus rhythm. Now analyze the P wave for enlargement. So if you have a P wave, next what you should do is, so we've seen the P wave, we've checked whether it's sinus rhythm. Look if the P wave is enlarged or not. Now how you do that is usually the P waves and leads 1, 2, 3 should be inspected for evidence of right or left atrial enlargement. So if usually lead 2 will have the clearest P waves, so look for lead 2 P wave. If the uh, the number of boxes, so the y-axis represents amplitude, if there's more than 3 small squares, i.e. here in this case is 4, this clearly means that this patient has a right atrial enlargement. On the other hand, in so that you're looking for lead 2 here. But on the other hand, in lead 1, if you were to see, there was an inversion and there was a negative deflection and it's less than 0 0.1 or negative deflection of more than 1 millimeter, sorry, defle negative deflection of more than 1 millimeter, then it suggests that the patient has left atrial enlargement. Next, measure the PR interval. The PR interval is very important because that's the main thing you look for. The normal PR interval lies between 0 .01, 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds or 3 to 5 small boxes on the ECC, ECG graph. A prolonged PR interval usually suggests an AV node, contraction de um, delay or some sort of thing. Now that can eventually lead to AV block. So you can a long PR interval. So PR intervals from the P waves so are indicated by the blue line to the start of the R wave. This usually indicates that AV block could be a first degree or a second degree. If the PR interval is shorter than 0 0.12, then it can also suggest Wolf Parkinson White syndrome or Lowen Ganglion Levine syndrome. Five, measure the QRS segment. The QRS segment is usually between 0 0.04 0 0.12. This is the smaller segment because it's the point where the ventricles contract. If you notice that the PRS is prolonged, this can eventually cause you to think about bundle branch block. It can be bundle branch block, could then be differentiated into left or right. Next, look for the T wave. Uh, the T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles and should be upright in leads two and appear after the QRS segment. For any variation, T wave are important. To note the inverted T waves in any leads can be due to lack of oxygen. Or too much potassium. So if you see a huge inversion of T wave, just like the R wave, so it's T wave which is like down, it can represent hyperkalemia. 
flat T waves may be due to little potassium and so hypokalemia. So if the T wave is too flat, it could be hypokalemia. If the T wave is too prolonged or it's a very large peak, it can be hyperkalemia. Now the ST segment is very important because the ST segment can usually determine whether someone had myocardial infarction or heart attack, which we will talk about in later in a different video. 7. Determine the electrical axis. The axis of the heart usually lies between minus 30 degrees and plus 90. So that's the normal range of everyone's heart. So minus 30 to 90 degrees. So if you have the heart between, if you find out the axis is between minus 30 to 90, that means the patient has a left axis deviation. If it's plus 90 to minus uh, uh, 180, then the patient has a right axis deviation. How you go about doing this is by looking at two main leads, lead 1 and lead AVF. In lead leads 1, if there is a positive deflection, that means if you look at this graph, now listen carefully, start at the point, so the positive deflection is towards zero, so that you're somewhere here, it's positive, right? And if lead AVF is also positive, that means it is in the normal range. So positive meaning plus 90 to zero is positive. But on the other hand, if you have a positive deflected, positive deflected AV, a lead one, so it's in this direction, but on the other hand, you have a negative deflected AVF, so it goes in this direction. Now, what happens is you have some sort of, so your heart basically lies between here and here, so you have a left axis deviation. If you have a right axis deviation, you would have a negative deflection of the left, um, of the lead one, which towards this direction and a right axis deviation and a positive deflection so here so we have negative here and then the um, AVF is still positive so this way so you have a right axis deviation and the left axis deviation one more time the lead one was positive but lead AVF was negative so that means AVF is in this direction so it has to be the heart has to lie somewhere here, so therefore it was in a left axis deviation. If the right in right axis deviation, the lead one is negative, so this direction, and your right axis uh, and your lead AVF is in the positive direction, so it lies in the right. If you think about it carefully, you can figure it out. Now, if both leads one and AVF are both negative, that means they lie in this proportion known as the intermediate axis. Another way to work it out, or you kind of by heart the mechanism, is if lead 1 is positive and lead 2 is negative, usually that means you have a left axis deviation. So you can kind of, they kind of equalize each other out. But if read lead 1 uh, is negative and lead 2 is positive, so the opposite then you have a right axis deviation. So thank you for watching the basic video of ECG. Please subscribe to the channel.